there is always that awkward silence before the what yes. call starts. <laughs> like, well, yes. yes. This is when I usually say, hello, everyone who's joined so far. We're just going to take a minute and let others jump jump yeah. online so we don't look like we're uh, paintings in Hogwarts that are, you know, vaguely moving. Yeah. <laughs> I'm, I'm afraid after this is all over with, when I'm in a conversation, I'll just automatically say, unmute yourself. <laughs> It's amazing how people still are not mute, unmuting themselves after months of managing Zoom. Just, I was in a call yesterday on the, with the IDB, the mm -hmm. and people were just not unmuting themselves. Yes, yeah, it's a, it, it is pretty funny. So, or the um, people who forget to mute themselves and start typing during a meeting and you don't mm -hmm. pay attention. That's the other. Yeah. You can go the other way. <laughs> <laughs> it's definitely a two-way street Only <laughs> for all of us. So, well, good afternoon, everyone, depending on where you're joining from. Um, why don't we just get started? Um, my name is Courtney Doggart, and I'm the president of Network 2020. We're a New York-based uh, nonprofit, nonpartisan organization that's really trying to create informed conversations around what's happening in the rest of the world. Um, and, you know, like everyone else during coronavirus, we've moved online, which has been wonderful in many ways because it has given us the um, capacity without geographic limitations to, um, to bring people who we ordinarily might not be able to. Chris Sabatini has spoken to us before in person when he was in New York, but we're delighted that he's able to join us from London. Uh, we have Karen Zuzis, uh, who's in Mexico, and Alora Alonso, who's in Buenos Aires, if I'm not mistaken or, or somewhere <laughs> somewhere not too far from there so um, I'm going to really quickly um, read the bios of everyone uh, I'm going to give a truncated version their their real accomplishments are much are much greater but I, I want to keep as much time as possible for um, for the discussion um, so Chris Sabatini he is a senior fellow for Latin America at Chatham House and was formerly a lecturer in discipline at the School of International and Public Affairs at Columbia University. He is also on the advisory boards of Harvard University's uh, LASPAU and of the Inter-American Foundation. In 2015, Chris founded and directed a new research nonprofit, Global Americas. Uh, from 2005 to 2014, he was the senior director of policy at the America Society and the Council of the Americas and the founder and editor-in-chief of the hemispheric policy magazine, America's Quarterly. Prior to that, he was director for Latin America and the Caribbean at the National Endowment for Democracy and a diplomacy fellow with the American Association for the Advancement of Science, working at the U.S. Agency for International Development's Center for Democracy and Governance. He provides regular interviews for major media outlets and has a PhD in government from the University of Virginia. Karen Zizis, is the editor-in-chief of America Society uh, Council of the Americas Online, which is, the, which is their website, uh, and is an award-winning journalist whose commentary has been featured by outlets across the Americas. She's based in Mexico City uh, and has been for seven years, where she focuses on uh, Mexican politics and U.S.-Mexico relations and holds an MA in journalism and Latin American studies from New York University. Laura Alonso is a profound analyst of Argentina and Latin American politics and institutions. She was the head of the anti-corruption office in Argentina for four years, a member of Congress for six in uh, executive director and program manager of the chapter of Transparency International in Argentina for eight years. She has been a speaker at the OECD, the IMF, World Bank, uh, and Aspen Ideas Festival, Women in the World, Council on Global Affairs uh, at Harvard, Stanford, and Columbia Universities, uh, uh, among others. Uh, she is a political scientist from the University of Buenos Aires and holds a master's degree in public administration and public policy from the London School of Economics. Uh, I hope that we will be joined by Jim Upton, James Upton, who is a senior portfolio specialist and chief strategic officer for the global emerging markets team at Morgan Stanley. Uh, so he might jump on and be our moderator. Um, so don't be surprised if, if I'm suddenly replaced mid-call. Um, with that, I'd like to turn it over to this really terrific panel um, and ask each of you, if you wouldn't mind, and we'll start with you, Chris, um, just to give an overview of, you know, a lay of the land of what's happening. And, and just so you all know, Chris, that will be really focusing on Brazil, Karen, on Mexico, and Laura on, I think, both, I believe both Argentina and Chile, if, um, if I'm not mistaken. So, um, so with that, Chris, we'd love to hear from you first. 
Thank you, Courtney. Uh, as you mentioned, I've spoken before in person, uh, I think several times actually in Network 2020. It's always a pleasure to do so and get the chance to talk, uh, get to see some of the houses of your hosts uh, and uh, get to have some wine, but this is a good close second. So I'm gonna talk generally about the region uh, and the impact of COVID-19 on the region, a little bit about Brazil. Um, on the, you know, most people, when they talk about how it's affecting the region, and we see now that basically the region, people are talking about the Western Hemisphere as being sort of ground zero for the next sort of uh, center for uh, an outbreak. Uh, and we're already seeing in the case of Brazil, for example, uh, it has the second highest number of deaths from COVID-19 after the United States. Um, and people often have been looking at the region uh, as being explained, its policies and the effects of COVID-19 is being explained uh, by populist governments versus non-populist governments um, of whatever stripe. Um, so people were often lumping together, and Karen will talk about this, Mexico, uh, Nicaragua, and Brazil, both under populist governments of the left and the right, uh, which had very little uh, interest uh, in science, uh, very little interest in imposing policies, um, I think largely that had to do with several things. In part, it has to do with their own perceptions of uh, their own constituents. Uh, this is severely affecting any lockdown or quarantine measures severely affect those in the informal sector, which make up anywhere from uh, half to even more, 60% uh, in the case of Peru, of the economically active population. So Bolsonaro, AMLO, uh, to a certain extent Daniel Ortega, uh, they're looking at their, their popular base of the underorganized um, informal sector and realizing what quarantine measures will do uh, to those, those um, active populations. But on the other hand, there's also just a simple DNA. Uh, and there's an article coming out in the New York on precisely this issue of these populists. Um, and it, it has to do with really their own sort of lack of concern with science, um, lack of willingness to accept checks and balances on their power, um, their sort of willingness to dismiss and connect directly with the people um, that explains also what they're doing. So it's not just political calculation, I think it is also sort of personal calculation um, and the, the uh, personal uh, makeup, if you will, of these people. Um, the, the second thing, though, is we're not seeing just those countries with the highest rates. Uh, even Peru, which, uh, whose uh, interim president, Martin Vizcarra, did all the right thing. It was very quick in responding uh, to the quarantine measures, imposed very strict measures, um, has seen its uh, uh, COVID-19 cases spike um, at, at an alarming rate. And this has to do not obviously with his policies, but having to do with the nature of the Peruvian economy, the nature of population density in the cities, um, and the inability of the government often to impose uh, uh, effective quarantine measures. There's one uh, picture that I remember seeing uh, taken by a friend of mine who lives in Peru of people queuing up, I can say queue because I'm in London now, um, at a bank to receive their stimulus checks. Um, and you know they were clearly not social distancing. Um, and then there was a whole run on the bank and they all crowded the doors of the bank. And clearly there are other factors here than just the ability of a government to impose uh, its policies. Um, so that, that's larger, but we're also looking not just at the infection rates in these cases, uh, but also at the effect on the economy. Uh, according to the World Bank uh, recent uh, report, the Latin American economies taking out Venezuela, which is a separate case entirely, I can talk about uh, the, the real risk of a massive humanitarian crisis as a result of COVID-19 in Venezuela, but the economies are expected to contract this year alone by 7.2%. Um, uh, Brazil is even higher at 8%. So you're looking at uh, situations where these both economic contracting economies, um, which at best they will flatline in 2021. Um, I think that's op actually quite optimistic. It's depending on a better scenario uh, for the global economy. Um, and at a time when these economies, again, taking out the case of Venezuela uh, for the last six years have been bumping along at one to 2% average growth, um, which is not sufficient to uh, bring in uh, new entrants in the, in the formal labor market, and has not been sufficient to sustain what was one time hailed as the sort of the success story of Latin America, which is the 50 million people who would join the middle class. So you're seeing in Latin America now, and for the indefinite future, the first time a shrinkage of the middle class, and that is going to have real impacts uh, politically 
uh, in terms of expectations. And I'll, I'll end on this note. Um, besides you know, what we're seeing in terms of all the effects in terms of infection rates, effects on the economy, we're also seeing elections being postponed. Last year, 2019, the story about Latin America was the year of social protest. Now, some people tried to rather simply make connections across all those protests. They were for different reasons. Bolivia's was different than the Dominican Republic's from Chile's. But what happened is in many of those cases, elections were called. In the case of Bolivia, there were going to be new elections uh, uh, after Evo Morales tried to steal the elections. Those have had to be postponed indefinitely. In Chile, they're going to convene an election, a plebiscite referendum on whether to rewrite the constitution. That has also been postponed indefinitely. Um, in the Dominican Republic, uh, they also have had to postpone uh, presidential elections. And these are all countries that had social protests. So you're looking at really the risk of a real pressure cooker. Um, and that is unfortunately my phone, which is ringing. I apologize for that. Um, the uh, real pressure cooking scenarios uh, in this that I think beyond the economic impact, beyond the tragedy of COVID infections are going to have uh, a real risk for social upheaval uh, in the future. And I'll leave it to my esteemed colleagues who, uh, it's great, they're both friends. It's great to see them here. I'm gonna give a plug actually, by the way, for Karen's website on ASCOA. It has the most comprehensive data on infection rates and policies and economics um, in Latin America. So if you wanna learn more, check out Karen's website on ASCOA.org. You can send me that check later, Karen. <laughs> no, it's very good. Thank you so much, Chris. Um, uh, Laura, if it's okay, I'll, I'll go now. I'll, I'll use that as a segue. Um, if you want to go to the page in particular that Chris referred to, it's as-coa.org slash coronavirus. Um, and, uh, and there's a lot of information there. Um, we looked, we actually started this page uh, about a week after uh, coronavirus landed in Latin America. So coronavirus landed um, in Brazil on February 26th. The first confirmed case was a couple days later in Mexico. Um, and to some degree, I think the one advantage that Latin America had is that uh, coron the coronavirus moved through other regions before it hit Latin America. Um, so especially as it hit the Western Hemisphere and we were seeing what was happening in New York, uh, where some of you are, um, it, we, we got to see the impact uh, here in Latin America. And I think that if I'm gonna look at overall the different government measures that uh, were taken and some of the economic impacts and reactions, you, you kind of see about a, roughly a three different breakdowns. You have um, some countries that reacted very quickly and have managed to somewhat keep things under control so far. It's difficult. We know that this is, a, is an unpredictable situation. Maybe it will not stay that way. But if we're going to look at them, we could say that Costa Rica, Paraguay, and Uruguay have roughly kept things under control. Um, and some of that has been about reacting very quickly once, once they had their first confirmed cases. You had some countries that reacted very quickly and put in very strict measures. Um, and one of them is Peru, which, which Chris referred to, very much impacted by the large informal economy there. So they put in, in, in place these strict measures, but they still saw a very large number of cases. Panama would, might be another example of that. Then there are the countries that I sort of think of as the mixed messaging countries. Um, countries like Brazil, or, or you could say that Nicaragua is like the no messaging at all country, seeing as Daniel Ortega disappeared for 30 days early when the pandemic arrived there. Um, and I would put Mexico in the last category, although I would say that, uh, because I do think that the government has been mixed in its messaging around it, but I, I would say that it's been a little bit more coherent than Brazil. Um, we do have, a, what I'll call the coronavirus czar. He's the deputy minister. Every night he gives a press conference. Um, people are critical of some of the measures he's taken and some of the approaches. One of the, the, the biggest criticisms is that he has been saying for weeks that we're hitting the peak, but the peak keeps going up, right? So, um, however, he does deliver information in, in, in a more managed way. And, and so um, that has been a little bit more coherent. Um, but one of the reasons I'd also put Mexico in that category is because in spite of very early on having these regular press conferences, um, it was the second country to confirm a case, but it took a month to, de to declare a health emergency. And over that period of time, the president um, continued to travel. The president, Andres Manuel Lopez Obrador, continued to travel. Um, there were incidents that got a lot of press, such as when he was asked how he's protecting himself, taking good luck charms out of his wallet. Um, and 
he has, he's given a message that can be along the lines of, well, how will Mexico protect itself? It will protect itself thanks to the fact that Mexicans are honest, and if you are moral, and if you don't steal, and if you don't cheat, then you'll be fine. It's this idea of like, if you are morally good, everything will be okay, right? Um, he did travel the country, and even early on, he stopped for a while, and he's been better about observing social distancing, but he has started traveling, and, and he really resists being seen with a mask. So again, this is part of the mixed messaging issue, this idea that, you know, it, it, it takes a, when you have a leader who will, who will really observe uh, precautions, will appear with a mask, uh, that sends a message to your population. We know we've seen this in other countries. If you don't wear a mask, you're sending the message you don't need to wear a mask, right? Um, and even though Mexico entered a period of social distancing, that, that was, it wasn't very obligatory. It wasn't really obligatory. It was, um, it's been something where people have, I will say that you've seen obviously like a huge decrease in mobility in Mexico, um, but there isn't really something where, where, with the exception of certain states where measures have been much stricter, on a federal level, it isn't something where, oh, I'm going to uh, break the, the law and someone's going to take me away. I mean, I can give an example. I went into, after the social distancing went into effect, I went into a, an, an ice cream parlor and I asked them, I said, why are you open? I mean, uh, ice cream, I, I like it, but it's not an essential service. And uh, the woman said, well, we're going to wait until we either drop below earning a certain amount per day or they come and fine us. Until that happens, we will stay open. They ha are still open, okay? So, <laughs> so that tells you they have enough foot traffic and they're not getting fined, right? Um, so and on top of that, Mexico is the country with the fourth highest number of confirmed cases in Latin America, but it has the second highest number of deaths. Um, it has one of the lowest rates of testing in all of Latin America. It's, it sits between Bolivia and Honduras in this regard. And this is actually the strategy is, part of the strategy is, a, is it's called sentinel surveillance. They've done purposely low testing. Um, and so, yes, Chile and Peru have much higher numbers of cases, but they are testing at much higher rates. So we see a very high mortality rate in Mexico as a result of this because we just don't really have a good handle on how many confirmed cases there are. Um, now, there are some reasons, I think, for this reluctance to just shut down, to be very strict. Um, some of it is, so, some of the things we're seeing in other countries. One, for one thing, we have an economic issue. We, we, we were talking a little bit before we started, and this is, Mexico is not alone in this in terms of its economic struggles. And Mexico was entering a recession before the pandemic hit. Um, nearly 60% of Mexicans work in the informal sector, and about half of Mexicans live in poverty. Um, some 12 million Mexicans stopped working in April and about 900,000 formal jobs have been lost in just the past two months. And it's simply just not easy for people to stay at home. And one of the big reasons why is because the government of Lopez Obrador really isn't giving an incentive for people to do so. Um, it's been sticking with its measure of austerity. He's very fearful of debt. Um, and fiscal stimulus to mitigate COVID's effects is just over, uh, is it just over 1% of GDP in Mexico compared to say about 12% in Chile, just to give you an idea. For the most part, the social programs that he has been trying to push during this time are really limited to ones he already had in place. So things that will be benefiting like, you know, ex giving pensions earlier uh, to the elderly. Um, a lot of those programs leave out working people, working age people. There is a, um, a program for, to give microloans to small and medium-sized enterprises, but it's only for, you only get about $1,000. So um, of the 4 million they're offering, only 1.5 million have been accessed. And many people are saying, I'll take it because I'll take whatever I can get, but $1,000 an $1,000 loan just isn't going to necessarily save my business. Um, so that's something that you hear in a lot of reporting here. Um, I will say that one thing is Mexico is now actually going in a, through a reopening period. We, as far as, if you're going to look at the numbers, we have not reached peak, okay? But we're reopening anyway. And some of the reason, I think, for that is also Mexico's geographic position and just how close it is uh, how close it is to the United States and being integrated into supply chain. So the United States has actually, you know, initially there was sort of a, a back and forth around, well, Mexico, when are you going to open your factories? When are you going to start 
opening your factories again. And at first Mexico was like, well, we have to really go on our own schedule. But ultimately they did start opening their factories. There was back and forth on, on auto manufacturing and when they would do that. Um, and so that's been another challenge that Mexico faces. Um, uh, Chris already gave us some of those GDP numbers, but I, I just want to wrap up by saying the World Bank is forecasting that uh, GDP contraction for Mexico will be about 7.5% this year, and the OECD is putting it at 8.6%. So I think I've, uh, I might have gone over my time, and I'd love to hand it over to Laura now. Thank you very much, and thank you for having me. Uh, are you listening to me? Yes. I see that everybody says yes. Thank you, I'm in Buenos Aires. Uh, so uh, here we have had 90 days of what I call extreme lockdown in the city of Buenos Aires and surroundings. The country has been under lockdown for almost 75 days. And now many provinces are reopening. However, in any uh, place of the country, classes, uh, are on. So students and pupils are at home with their parents. The economic situation, it's complicated because we were coming from our own recession. The quarantine and the pandemia gave uh, more ingredients for this economic uh, recession. There have been some measures taken by the federal government with regards to social health and some subsidies to small medium enterprises to pay part of the salaries in order to restrain companies to um, dismiss employees. However, uh, in the first 13 days of uh, lockdown, 100,000 uh, employment jobs, um, uh, jobs were lost. And this was in the 15 days of uh, lockdown. So what we are seeing now is that some activities started, economic activities, essential and others uh, started to operate in the rest of the country, but not in the city of Buenos Aires and its surroundings. In general, everybody approved the quarantine at the very early stage. However, uh, through the weeks, uh, uh, the public opinion started to um, diminish or decrease its support to the, to the quarantine because of uh, economic restrictions that most of the population is facing. A recent, a recent public opinion poll said that 53 of the asked people uh, recognized that their income was reduced and 53% of the people recognized a, reduce, a reduction in their income. For example, in the city of Buenos Aires, in the past uh, two weeks, some uh, restaurants opened their doors, but not to have people inside the restaurants. So they are uh, doing some delivery and uh, taking away method. In general, what they say is they are selling eight to 10% of what they used to sell before. So uh, we are seeing a lot of, uh, you know, uh, small, medium commerce uh, locking down. They are closing forever, saying that they can't pay the rent, they can't pay the employees. And this is the third month, and it seems that we are going to have a longer lockdown in the metropolitan area for the next month, or maybe longer. So the situation uh, in general does not look well because of now economic reasons so when you go to uh, and analyze what's going on in argentina with lockdown the early decision was correct the peak never arrived it seems that it's arriving now this it happened the same as in mexico so it, the peak is coming the peak is coming but it never comes so we flattened a curve but the curve is killing the economy it's flattened but it's killing the economy at the same time and uh, what we see, for example, in our neighbors, Uruguay, because, you know, when we speak about Latin America, it's many Latin Americans, as, as Karin was showing. So what we see in Uruguay is that they had a voluntary lockdown. They appealed, of course, it's a small country. They don't have uh, Montevideo, the capital city doesn't have the dimensions of Buenos Aires and the metropolitan area or of San Pablo, for example, or, or Rio in Brazil or Mexico City. 
uh, and they manage the crisis in a very different way. Uh, and however, they will be economically impacted by Brazil and Argentina, of course, because they are uh, very economically dependent on, on us. When you go to Chile, at the very beginning, you saw that Chile was dealing with the crisis, the health crisis in a good way. However, they lost control. And now the cases and the peak is increasing and increasing and increasing. So if Argentina has to show a success, it's that we have one of the lowest death tolls in the region. That's the fact. Uh, however, uh, we have seen low state capacities in the country. For example, the same uh, picture that uh, Chris describes of people uh, queuing in the banks to have their uh, paychecks uh, cashed was the same thing that happened here two months ago. So uh, as I was reading a couple of articles by Frank Fukuyama in the past uh, couple of months, and he says, okay, we, let's not discuss about democracies or autocracies. Let's discuss about state capacities, about political leadership and social trust. And I think that what we are seeing in Latin America, it's, and we will have to analyze that in a couple of months, probably or semesters, we are seeing a lot of failure with state capacities. So if I were an investor or a multilateral development bank, I would rethink uh, my investment and my assistance together with some really uh, institutional conditionalities because state uh, capacities show uh, in Latin America the big failure. We, are, we can do better if we had a better state. And we have states that are weak, that are corrupt, that don't have uh, uh, professional capacities that are still managed and, and run by uh, people that believe that they own the states. Uh, so we need really to make that, I think, take that step in the future. So Latin America needs an assistance plan. Again, we are not going to be able to survive this crisis uh, without uh, not only uh, economic crisis, I think that there could be something worse, which is a general collapse of the economy and the institutional side of the issue, and people will suffer a lot. So there is an opportunity. There is an opportunity, and the investors and the multilateral development banks and those countries that assist with cooperation, uh, Latin American countries, have an opportunity to negotiate uh, to negotiate a better, um, better deals and agreements with many of our countries, and I hope it happens. Thank you. Th th thank you, Laura, um, and and Karen and Chris. So, so the good news is that uh, uh, James Upton, our moderator, has joined us. I believe, unfortunately, due to technical difficulties, he will just be joining by phone. So, uh, with that, I'm going to turn it over to you, Jim James. Are you there? Hi. Great. Thank. You. Thanks, Courtney, uh, and apologies for the Zoom. I you won't get to see my great uh, bookcase I was making a great effort to have in the background, but sorry about that. Um, maybe just to, to take things to another uh, angle, um, you know, Brazil, despite, um, you know, the challenges that we've been discussing, just to look at it, Brazil now in the month of June is up, you know, 11%, the equity market. And there are some elements that are helping Brazil's, uh, not, not just the stock market, but investors' perception of the place, which is that, you know, agriculture with the cyclical, you know, at some point markets look for, markets are discounting mechanisms that look forward and they're thinking about the cyclical recovery from, from COVID. It's looking out to next year and it's thinking that Brazil has the significant tailwind of uh, agricultural exports that the rest of the world one. So maybe just to start with um, Brazil, and we can then get into a little bit more detail about some of the other countries. But Chris, you know, what is your best sense for reform as it was occurring before COVID kicked in in terms of some very significant things on Social Security, fiscal spending, uh, all of which investors very much responded positively to. Um, and so maybe could you talk about like 
maybe trying to envision beyond COVID, which I know is hard to do when we're hitting a million cases in, in Brazil, but that investors do look forward and Brazil does have these significant tailwinds and maybe talk a little bit about that, um, the implications of that. Yeah, thanks, Jim. The, um, a few points. Uh, one is, uh, as with most of um, the economies globally, uh, the risk is, is that they will still be strong um, under elements, uh, foundations of these economies um, that will do quite well. As you mentioned, Brazil and its agriculture, uh, obviously Argentina and Uruguay as well, especially as China continues to, uh, it seems, grow out of this. Uh, that will benefit. Now, the question is, is what this will mean in terms of sort of the service sector economies within. Brazil obviously does very well in terms of its agricultural trade. China is its number one trade partner, and a lot of that is consumption of raw materials, including ag. Um, but the question is, is what it will mean in terms of sort of the man on the street or woman on the street, if you will, in Brazil. And I think that's, that's going to be a big question. Um, you also have the advantages that, uh, in the case of Brazil, the um, the government is uh, the, the development bank of Brazil has uh, forgiven the debt of state and local governments, which has given them a fair amount of breathing space, um, and has also uh, um, a lowered interest rates. So it, it, it's a curious situation where you have, um, uh, in many ways, an erratic. Um, I would even argue a, a somewhat um, uh, reprehensible president in some of his positions on human rights and other things, but he has a good economic team and he's allowed them to stay. Uh, he's removed uh, one health minister, another one resigned, um, tried to hide the data on COVID-19, uh, but was forced to put it back up. Uh, but his economic team with Geddes is, is actually quite solid. Um, so I think that's a, a, good, a good case. Colombia will also probably do well um, coming out of of COVID-19 because of its, its uh, uh, economy and its economic stewardship. Uh, Chile the same way. But in all of these cases, uh, we're looking at sort of specific export sectors uh, that will do well. Um, and it, I would argue you know, the, the, the concentration of the market around those sectors um, could be deeply damaging to a number of, of these other places. I, I'll also argue, state, I wanna keying off what Laura had said, I'm working with a number of former finance ministers uh, from Latin America uh, in a project at Chatham House. And uh, you know, the real risk here is that these countries are going to come out with a real fiscal over, uh, hangover, basically. Um, in the case of Peru, they've, pumped, they've promised to pump in about 7% of GDP in the stimulus packages. Um, you're looking at the possibility of sovereign debt defaults across the board. Uh, in the next uh, year or two. So we'll see what that does in terms of rattling markets um, overall, despite maybe some good fundamentals in the case of Brazil. And then maybe loud up on a similar idea, you know, before COVID, we had the, um, you know, the massive social protests that were really related in many ways to income inequality. And so maybe I'll, I'll ask both, um, um, both um, uh, Laura and, and, and Kristen, real quick, the, um, you know, you have two different approaches, income inequality uh, in Chile, and then you, you know, you have Lopez Obrador and uh, AMLO in, in Mexico, who, you know, is addressing it, um, and, and yet some of his policy responses are seen as negative. I guess, you know, two countries, how would you compare and contrast how their administrations have approached income inequality and, you know, whether we're sort of seeing two, two uh, extremely different reactions on Pineda's part and AMLO's part and, and, and yet, you know, still having, uh, still having um, social problems related to it. I know it's a broad question, but maybe start with, with you, Lada, on, on Chile and the well, as you know, I'm not the Chilean expert. I am a neighbor because I'm in Argentina, but I can answer. I think I can answer that uh, uh, there has been a temporary, I hope, suspension of the proposal made uh, by President Piñera to discuss a reform of the Constitution. So I guess that that will be the opportunity for uh, for social act, social and economic actors and 
of course, political actors to re discuss uh, new uh, institutional, political, socioeconomic contract for Chile through the reform of the constitution. Uh, however, what uh, we see on the other side of the Andes here in Argentina, and I, I would like Chris and others to start, you know, we don't have a Bolsonaro here, but we have Vice President Cristina Kirchner behind, mm -hmm. the, the behind President Alberto Fernandez. And what we have seen in the past two weeks, if you read also commentators and political analysts, is that uh, Cristina's power has consolidated behind uh, the president and uh, the Argentine president, every time there is a controversial decision or a assessment or a statement that he makes or, or decides, he has to clarify all the time that he is taking the decision and it's not Christina. So here also we are having a very weird, different type of government from the rest of Latin America. I would start, uh, I, I would like you to start taking note of this because of course Fernandez is not Bolsonaro, Fernandez is not AMLO, but Christina Kirchner is operating behind the curtains and uh, what's, uh, this, this is a, a, a new invention of the Argentine democracy. And I really want to raise a flag around this uh, because we, you know, uh, what I'm reading from all the experts is that the populists here are Bolsonaro, are AMLO, Ortega, but we are not uh, including the Argentine government, and I think that's a mistake. Uh, when you see that on economic policy and when you see what's going on with uh, some institutional power grabs uh, from the executive, the judiciary is closed. The Supreme Court is closed in Argentina. It's been closed for three months, the Supreme Court of Justice. So there are some issues that should be, you know, uh, taken. So I think that if you, if you compare or if you see Chile, there is an expectation that after COVID, something good or positive may happen to contain the social discontent that was expressed last year. There is a promise, there is an expectation, and I, I think that there is also some certainty that things there will um, will be channeled into a, in an institutional manner. Great, thanks. And Karn, maybe just on that theme of income inequality and the, some of the criticisms Am Lo has received for some of his policies, which arguably have given a disincentive to foreign investors, um, particularly on the direct side, particularly in, in energy, um, you know, and how, how does a leader deal with that very real issue of trying to, you know, he was, a, he was after all elected with a majority, he was elected with, you know, supporting Congress. By all democratic measures, he was very strongly endorsed by the electorate in, in coming to power. So, um, you know, could you sort of address that issue of income inequality and how that may be exacerbated or how he'll, um, you know, potentially deal with it differently as a result of COVID? Yeah, I mean, I think it's, it's also important to note that he continues to be popular. We see a lot of criticism in international press, but his, his, it depends on which um, pollster you're looking at, but the really reputable pollsters are still putting him at about 60% approval, which uh, many leaders would be envious of. Um, and I think we have to keep in mind that, um, yes, he did win with a really strong uh, mandate. Um, his party washed over the country like a wave. It's a very new party. Um, and he really uh, won um, in part because of the low, low popularity of the, the outgoing government. Um, Mexico, to some degree, if you look at approval over time, doesn't really seem to punish its leaders too strongly. but. Peña Nieto, 
they punished him. <laughs> we, we sometimes mm -hmm. now see how polarized we are. We, we, it feels polarized here in Mexico to some degree. Uh, and sometimes people make jokes and, and say, remember when we were all united in making fun of our last leader and, and, and we all united in disliking him? Um, so AMLO did come in um, really uh, in, in part uh, because of the lack of popularity. And on this, I'm going to fight corruption mandate, right? So he came in with this idea of, we're going to be austere. We're going to cut all this waste. Um, we, we're not going to be wasteful on all of these projects. He canceled the this huge uh, modernization of an a modernizing airport project, um, saying that it was it was corrupt. Although nobody has been charged with anything yet. Um, and some of those moves, yet we just also I should say that he came in he came into office, um, and on the inaugural day he gave a speech talking about that criticized the last 30 years um, uh, of governance in the country for if for neoliberalism. Um, and he is someone who is just kind of old school. He um, really is looking back to Mexico's past and we can see it in his energy policy. It's like Pemex or bust. It does not matter um, how much it is dragging down Mexico's economy. There is a sense of nationalism around uh, the oil sector in um, in, in Mexico that, I mean, we still have a national holiday celebrating the expropriate, the 1938 expropriation of, of the oil sector in Mexico. We have to remember this. Um, and so he has, while he's canceled this modernization project, he has, is, he is going full steam ahead on an $8 billion oil refinery project. He is going um, full steam ahead on an $8 billion train project through the Yucatan Peninsula that many environmentalists are saying um, will, will greatly harm the environment. And But let's go back to his popularity. He is still um, very popular. One thing that is very interesting, and, 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 and we should also note that um, those who, that he has support for not... Um, if you look at some questions in some of the polls, people do not support creating more debt. Um, but when asked about these big hallmark projects, he's starting like Dos, Dos Bocas, the refinery, um, people say, no, you should stop and it helps small business owners before you should be investing in this. So it's interesting because the, he, he, again, he's somewhat old school. He um, is looking back to Mexico's past, I really hesitate to say, like, make Mexico great again, but there is some nostalgia here um, for an idea of when things were less unequal, um, uh, of, of uh, maybe perhaps when things were a little bit easier <laughs> or simpler, I should say. Um, and part of that is just putting all of your eggs in this energy basket, um, in this oil basket. And I should say oil basket because um, there have been steps taken by his government to undercut uh, renewable energy contracts. Um, and, and as of course, he's also uh, the doing thing, taking steps like canceling the, the airport project have made investors worried to say the least, because you just don't know when the rules of the game will be changed in terms of contracts. Um, did that answer your question? I, I, I covered a lot of ground, purple, <laughs> but um, how he's gonna address inequality, I, I'll just say one last thing, because I, I know I've talked for a bit, is that his social programs, if you look at some analysis done by um, organizations here, the, the general consensus is that his, his social programs, which are, again, for the, a lot of times, uh, pensions for the elderly, scholarships for the young, um, will not necessarily help the country's poor to um, cover what we call the, the canasta basica here, the, their basic needs in terms of uh, food and, and costs, right? Um, and how does all, I've been talking about a lot of things that actually have, don't necessarily have to do with coronavirus. About half of people are worried, are now very concerned about what, how things are going to go with the economy in Mexico. And um, UN forecasts that about 6 million more Mexicans are likely to fall into extreme poverty um, through this. Um, so that'll get us to 17 million total. Uh, another 7 million will fall into poverty, so that brings us to 49 million total, and some 11.5 million Mexicans could sink out of the middle class. So, you know, no one can stop the coronavirus, but we are not looking at a great equalization here. Um, mm -hmm. so I will stop there. <laughs> okay, and, and, and just to stay on Mexico for another moment, just because, mm -hmm. and to bring it back to COVID, 
it does seem obviously uh, uh, a natural negative is going to be that a lot of the service jobs that have been eliminated in the United States um, are obviously still with um, Mexican workers, you know, living here who are obviously not going to have the same amounts of money they can send back home to Mexico. Has that already started to show some effect? And is that something that uh, the government is sort of prepared to deal with? I'm not sure how prepared the government is to deal with. Interestingly enough, I believe it was in April, remittances actually went up. And I think the reason why is because, you know, if you, if you look at analysis, many, or I shouldn't just say I think the reason why, but one, one reasoning is that people in the United States know that their relatives and family members in Mexico are not getting some kind of coverage to, and, you know, there isn't, they're not getting what their 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 basic needs met, so they need to send send money home. But also a sort of panic in the United States of we're going to lose, we might lose our jobs. Send money home now. Um, so there there was at first an increase in remittances. It's expected now to come back down due to the job losses in the United States. And it's very interesting that you bring this up because, interestingly enough. Um, AMLO actually praised the migrants in the United States for sending money home. And this has been an ongoing issue that predates AMLO, this sort of, uh, this sort of sense that to some degree social welfare is getting um, outsourced to the United States for immigrants to send money back and cover the basic needs um, of of. Mexicans, uh, other family members in Mexico. And you can really see it that in a lot of cases in poorer states, that's where more remittance money goes, like states like Oaxaca. Um, and so, you know, AMLO doesn't seem to have, a, a, he's not necessarily preparing for that remittance drop. And if anything, he's praising migrants in the United States for sending money home. Mm -hmm. Great, thanks. And just to keep circulating around, um, Laura, in Argentina, um, are you seeing already some signs of behavior in terms of, uh, as a result of, you know, quarantine, lockdown, staying at home, whatever, that are already having uh, consequences on how people spend money in different ways? In other words, you know, uh, I want to—I don't want to speak about specific companies, but there are you know, sort of digital plan, advisor companies, e-commerce companies, um, all sort of electronic, you know, companies that are um, doing quite well in this environment. Have you, I guess, two questions, you know, how are, are you seeing behaviors change since people are not, perhaps not going to traditional stores as they had historically? And, and then maybe the larger question of what's happening to the middle, "Quote unquote middle class people who were doing quite well, owning a beauty salon, um, um, owning a small restaurant, and um, you know, will will they will they sort of how are they dealing, and will they go more to the sort of um, you know the old camp of 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 the state, you know, taking care of things, or you know, and will the prospect of you know continued reform just continue to wither, and what's their attitude?" Thank you. So I was listening to Karen and uh, parts of what she said with regards to AMLO, the public discourse, the public speech, uh, it's very similar. So here we feel that we are being ruled by uh, old school people. They speak about nationalism. They are, you know, they, they are now uh, promoting the expropriation of an agribusiness company. If there is a successful business in Argentina, it's agribusiness. If there is a modernized sector of the economy, it's agribusiness. And the government is behind the expropriation of a private company and the agribusiness uh, sector, uh, which has created in the past week uh, a very bad um, humor between the public opinion and we will see if this brings more protests different ways of protesting which we are you know we invent different ways of protest so uh, we, we are facing that with regards to cons co uh, consumers uh, yes there was at the very beginning three months ago 
uh, uh, an increase in e-commerce and e-education uh, and electronic, I don't know, training or whatever, but now uh, that some um, lockdown has been is down in, in some cities, what we see is that people are not consuming uh, even essential goods as they used to do before. So what we see is that the middle class has less money to spend. As I said before, 53% in, in a very recent poll said that their income went down. And this is middle class people, people that used to have their own jobs or were employ, employed in a, a private company. If you go to inf the informal economy that here it's 40%, uh, that people is completely uh, out of everything. There is no income. So what we are discussing usually here in Argentina, it's not about more jobs or creating more jobs or attracting investors, private investors to create jobs. We are not discussing about wealth. We are discussing about how the state or the government is going to give more public funds to the poor people and the new poor to survive this crisis. So the issue is that uh, I think that the government is not taking the, um, it's not understanding or doesn't want to understand that we need to create or reproduce uh, the um, correct incentives to private investors to come uh, or, and to stay in Argentina with their investments. And imagine that Argentina is also negotiating a sovereign debt agreement with the private uh, bondholders and with the IMF after that. And uh, it, it has taken uh, a lot of weeks and we are still not closing the agreement. So uh, people are spending more money. They have more money in their, uh, less money. Sorry, they are spending less money. They have less money in their pockets. Consumer habits are changing dramatically in the city of Buenos Aires and probably in the rest of the country. Uh, and this is mainly what, what you can read from some of the analysis with regards to, uh, to consumers and uh, the economy uh, in the city of Buenos Aires and, and the suburbs. Mm -hmm. And then it is interesting while we're still in Argentina to think about here in the north, of course, it's becoming uh, summer and people are going outdoors and socializing again. And of course, we have the protests going on as well. And so we're seeing the number of cases in many states, with the exception of New York, where it's been improving, the number of COVID cases going up as you enter winter in, um, in Argentina is going back indoors, um, projected to sort of help with the flattening or what, is, what are the best estimates you're seeing? Well, uh, as Karin said before, it's, the peak never came. It was announced many times in these three months. It seems that now we are in the worst three weeks because it's usually these three weeks in the year where all the um, uh, lung diseases uh, accelerate. So from influenza, uh, or, you know, pneumonia, and a cold, all, everything happens in this next three weeks. So the, the, in, a, in a sense, the, the curve has been flattened, the, but we have like 1,300 cases per day. Uh, the city of Buenos Aires have been detecting from 450 and 550 cases every day. The, the death toll is really low compared to other countries. And the issue now is in the province of Buenos Aires and the surroundings, the metropolitan area of Buenos Aires, because uh, as it was also said by Karen before, uh, in some communities in the poor neighborhoods in what is called the shanty towns, it's very difficult to keep social distancing and people are living all together. And usually when you go and try to track and trace case and find cases, you find them there. So there have been uh, poor communities locked down specifically for two or three weeks in order to control focuses of COVID there. But uh, still, the, um, and again, the capacities of the states, in many cases, it's very, very uh, worrying. 
and concerning. Uh, on the other hand, uh, the, the, uh, the existence, and I don't know what's going on in Brazil, but I think that there is a similarity in federal countries. Uh, local governments and state governments have different capacities. So in some provinces, the crisis, <clears throat> the health crisis and the economic crisis has been managed in a different way by governors and by, by mayors. So in a way, uh, you know, the, the capacities of the, of the state governments and the local governments have replaced uh, the lack of uh, capacities of the federal governments in many cases. And that's a really interesting topic. I'd like to, to turn to Chris too in regard to Brazil, um, because the struggle in, between, a, you know, a, a president who's seen as ineffective and state governors, many of whom are, are very well regarded and taking very different, um, different approaches to the COVID crisis um, is worth examining. And I had a question from an, um, someone on the line, um, Shantana Roy, who was saying, you know, crediting um, Brazil for dealing very effectively with the Zika virus spread, um, and in fact, arguably becoming a, a, a global role model for dealing with that, uh, in part through universal health care. I guess with the rotation of health ministers, you know, we've had, how, how do you see um, Brazil, you know, in this struggle between um, state uh, versus at the, you know, at the national level uh, in dealing with it from a health uh, healthcare perspective? Um, yeah, good question. So first, much of the frustration of Brazilian uh, public health experts. Brazil's public health system is very good. Um, and it is, um, in, and it's sort of become an embarrassment that they're performing so poorly on this uh, because it was a point of pride for them uh, for a very long time. Um, the, the, the issue, obviously, is, is that these, we're seeing the benefits of a federal system in which the governors, <coughs> excuse me, in Rio de Janeiro, Sao Paulo, um, Belo Horizonte, Belo Horizonte, Horizonte are being uh, much more cautious in the policies they apply. Uh, but again, you still have a president uh, that has refused to you know, even sanction the use of masks, let alone wear them. Um, and so the, and, and already now we're seeing Sao Paulo beginning to open up. Um, and I think having a president who has so openly mocked any policies to contain the virus has put pressure on governors uh, to start to open up, perhaps too early. Uh, and that's what we're seeing in the case of Sao Paulo. We're already seeing those cases beginning to increase. A lot of people like to make comparisons between Bolsonaro and Trump, and I know one of the questions uh, in the queue uh, did that, and I think that's absolutely right, uh, where uh, in a very polarized system in which a, a president um, has sort of demonstrated his, his disdain, if you will, uh, for uh, these sorts of measures, um, while in a federal system, the governors can pursue policies that uh, are more responsible in terms of containing the outbreak, um, the having the president as a figurehead at the top uh, creates a different dynamic that actually may undermine even the best intentioned governors. Uh, and I think we're seeing that in the case of Sao Paulo right now with the opening up in Brazil. So federal system is good, mm -hmm. but not always. And I know in the case of Mexico, there have been a few governors who pursued those policies as well, but it really, the messaging at the top does matter. Mm -hmm. And I guess, uh it's interesting, I'm getting some questions regarding border controls and flow of people, which I think is kind of interesting because again, before COVID, we had we had the Venezuelan political situation with a lot of um, quote unquote refugees going to other countries. So maybe just to go around the room, uh, the numbers of people who've come from Venezuela to your respective areas of uh, of expertise, uh, how has that played out, and are we seeing any moves um, in terms of border control uh, on countries, or is that irrelevant in, in the age of airplanes? I'll let my uh, colleagues talk about border controls in their, their countries. I'll talk a little bit about Venezuela. Um, you have over a million uh, Venezuelan refugees, and you, you, you said refugees, and I think that's correct. We need to label them as such, not just migrants. Um, some of in Colombia, uh, you have several hundred thousand in, in Ecuador, in Peru, 
uh, many of them are starting to go back. Uh, first of all, because many of them were the first ones to feel the brunt of the economic contraction. And when they did, uh, they began to find that they didn't have that support network of family uh, and friends uh, in many cases camps or, or towns along the border uh, that was necessary to sustain them. And so we're seeing a lot of them come back and that is raising the risk of, of and I was just on a call earlier today uh, with someone from Human Rights Watch and Johns Hopkins University. Uh, they issued a great report, uh, but we were talking about sort of the risk of, of the outbreak really ripping through Venezuela. And Venezuela, for example, only 80% of the hospitals don't have uh, access to regular water, potable water, uh, soap, and electricity. Um, so needless to say, uh, if it hits and really spreads quickly in Venezuela, uh, it could have a very drastic effect um, uh, and, and, and really strain a already uh, collapsed healthcare system. Um, in other places, like in Peru, there's actually a very good photo essay that was done. I can't remember who did it. Um, it may have been in the Atlantic of Venezuelans who have um, been working and, and burying the dead of COVID. Um, it's sort of the only job available. But of course, that has increased their own infection rates. Um, so in many of the cases, they, they've actually been the first responders, if you will, in COVID simply because of their uh, level of underemployment in these countries. Uh, but again, as, as this begins to hit, uh, we're, we're seeing them return. Uh, we're also seeing in some cases uh, growing uh, xenophobia against Venezuelans uh, because there is concern about uh, they're being infected at higher rates. Uh, this has happened in Peru, it's happened in Colombia. Uh, and that's very troubling as well uh, in a region that has very much prided itself historically on its solidarity uh, and commitment to its neighbors. I will say one other thing quickly on closing the borders that has been interesting uh, is despite all the divisions, for example, in Mercosur, um, the, we're, we are seeing uh, countries collaborate in the repatriation of citizens um, across borders, which has been very positive. Uh, and getting free flights, um, it helps when the president of Chile owns the national airline, the, the airline. Um, but this has been a, a one positive sign of cooperation across the hemisphere. Laura in Argentina. So uh, here, uh, I, I, I don't have any information and I haven't read anything about Venezuelans living here. More Venezuelans live in Chile than in Argentina. Uh, that's, that's also a fact. Uh, and I don't really know, I, I haven't have track of that. Uh, they usually work here in the delivery services. So I think that they have, you know, they still get their job. They still have their jobs. Uh, we have not seen any problems with Brazil in our border or with Chile. So it seems, you know, the Argentine and the Brazilian government, the presidents have not spoken in more than six months. This is unusual. There was not an official conversation between President Bolsonaro and President Fernandez. This never happened, at least in the past 40 years. I, I don't have a record. No one has a record of this. However, the um, Ministry of Foreign Affairs are doing their jobs. It seems that they are speaking. And uh, it doesn't look that we have a problem in the borders with them. Uh, also, Uruguay, the Uruguayan government is speaking with the Brazilian government to control the, the borders. But at some point, people will start to circulate and to move because we cannot freeze this type of situation forever. And in the next months, this will, you know, uh, this will have to change because if not, we will be living in a different type of political regime. And I think that the majority of Latin Americans, or at least in the Southern Cone, wants to circulate freely and to do business freely. So uh, we'll see what happens. With, with, with Chile, we are separated by the, by the mountains, so there is no issue. And uh, I don't know what's going on in the hot zone in the north with Bolivia, but it seems that uh, no one is moving, that most of the people are, uh, you know, we, we are uh, staying very quiet. We don't have flights inside the country. We only have mm -hmm. some repatriation flights. And uh, it's a very, it, it never happened before. This is really, uh, very, I don't know what's going on in Mexico with flights inside the country, but
but here no one can move from one place to the other unless you have a permit and uh, if you want to go no north and south uh, you need really to to find an excuse some cases for example were brought from people traveling from buenos aires to other provinces that had no cases before so there is also some issue mm. we don't see xenophobia however some people are uh, you know, saying that we will see an explosion of crime when some of the lockdown and the controls between the city of Buenos Aires and the suburbs are released. And this may happen mm -hmm. for sure because of the social situation of people. Mm -hmm. Not There is hungry people and, and we, mm -hmm. you know, people are not eating. They don't have money. It's not enough. They, are, they don't have sufficient food and money to buy for their kids, for their families. And, and this is very, very serious down here. So mm -hmm. um, I think that this will have uh, a serious impact in the future. And what we um, people repeat is that the government does not have an exit plan, which also creates more and more uncertainty. And the future is always uncertain, but now it's very uncertain. That's why I, I'm trying to create this idea that from this we can build an opportunity for Latin America. And I think that we can, but we have to think creatively and in a very innovative way. What are we going to do with the informal economy in Latin America? And that's an answer mm -hmm. that all our governments and the donors and the world has to answer. And if we made the right decisions, we can create a new path for development. Uh, also, mm -hmm. we have to rediscuss, at least in, the, in a country like Argentina, the tax system. We are taxing businesses and we are taxing people in a way that is totally unproductive and it goes against any, any progress and any idea of an affluent society. So again, we are discussing about social plans and poverty. We no, are not discussing about progress, development, and prosperity. And we need to change the. We need to change that line. If not, we will have mm -hmm. uh, 100 years of disaster. Mm -hmm. And and Karen, if I could uh, shift a little bit because I had a very interesting question from my old friend Jeffrey Dennis, who's one of the longtime most respected. Uh, strategist for Latin America and emerging markets in general on the line, asking about um, remittances to Mexico in April, did they rise in dollar terms or peso terms? And if the latter, um, one of the reasons, of course, would be the sharp decline of the peso. Um, yeah. And this it actually raises a broader point that I'd like to talk about with Chris as well, and Laura, to the extent you'd like to, in terms of what could argue, be argued as uh, uh, another tailwind which is the sharp depreciation of the region's currencies but particularly the brazilian real and the mexican peso which of course is long credited as one of the most freely floating currencies in the em universe Karen? yeah I, that was one thing i i, I uh, unfortunately don't have the figures right in front of me on remittances and how much they they um rose but um as I was trying to fit in so many comments in a short amount of time, one other um, thinking is that due to the peso drop, um, that would uh, have increased the value of remittances as well as giving a reason to send more remittances home. I, I unfortunately don't have the specific information. I can, I can track it pretty easily, um, but with all of the information that <laughs> I unfortunately don't have that. Sure. Oh, sure. No, and don't mean to put you on the spot, but I think I, I, I do think, you know, just question was interesting just to get us thinking about the massive currency shift we've seen that's been driven by the COVID crisis. So maybe, Chris, in Brazil, what would you um, broadly speak about in terms of, uh, I mean, it's a given that uh, agricultural exports will be cheaper, but maybe just sort of broadly speak about what could be an opportunity with the, the, the um, because, of course, foreign investors love love that. and. It's been one of the reasons that, uh, you know, the strong dollar versus emerging currencies is one of the reasons that emerging hasn't done as well. And by all accounts, just to note a little bit about what's going on in the U.S. with this massive stimulus at the fiscal and monetary level in the U.S., there have been a lot of um, a lot of commentators saying at some point the dollar does weaken from this. So 
maybe just hear your broad thoughts on shifts in the in the real and what that implies for the Brazilian economy. I mean, as you say, it makes it makes uh, uh, and Brazil is, I mean, with the exception of its agricultural exports, is a fairly uh, uh, closed economy. Um, so it won't. I mean, it won't. Will also not have the as powerful an effect uh, on increasing import costs because, uh, as I say, Brazil is is one of the least integrated global economies in Latin America. Um, so it will certainly benefit there, um, but we'll have to see. Uh, I mean, I think it's. Uh, you know, a weak currency can, can benefit, but it, what it, what will mean in terms of capital inputs um, on agriculture and other areas, uh, especially say, for example, in in uh, investment in, in infrastructure, uh, which is desperately needed, uh, will have to be the same. But you're right; it, 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 they are the currencies are doing better, uh, but the effects of, are going to vary depending on how integrated those economies are into uh, the global economy. Great. And then another very interesting question from Bill Lowe um, in terms of uh, how do you see the, re this is for everyone on the panel, um, you know, the, the region's major economic partners uh, or, you know, trading partners, et cetera, uh, either helping or, or contributing or in some way affecting the COVID crisis. And maybe China, maybe it's an interesting angle to bring in um, in China in terms of what have you seen from a foreign policy perspective in each of your respective uh, countries uh, in terms of China's offer to 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 help or not, or do something in regard to COVID, and and how are local policymakers responding? Maybe start with Laura. So uh, we received some. Uh, we bought and we received some supplies from China. They were defective, like in other countries that it happened in other countries. Um, Chinese have been trying to invest in Argentina for many, many years. They are investing. They also have, you know, uh, authorized by the Christina Kirchner's government, uh, very strange base uh, in Patagonia, in the province of Neuquén, if I'm not mistaken. So uh, there is a, 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 you know, I have felt for many years that the U.S., um, left Latin America because we are very complicated. And that's true. We have to, you know, that's a fact. It's a very complicated region. As I said before, Latin America is many Latin Americas at the same time with a lot of complexities. Uh, but for the Chinese, that is not uh, a factor to stop them. They are aggressive in the investments. They are, um, if they have to pay bribes, they pay bribes, nothing controls them, and they advance and make progress. So uh, I think that there is, this is an opportunity to rethink how the US and G7 countries uh, restart and reset their relationship with Latin America. And it's also an opportunity for Latin America to rethink its development way or its development path. So, uh, you know, I do not like what China offers to my country and to Latin America. I prefer to, to, to chat with you and with the Europeans, but uh, I think that there is, there is an opportunity for, for you, uh, for investors in the US and for the banks, as I said before, and the governments to rediscuss uh, development with Latin American countries and with some of our regional institutions, with, which also need to re rethink and redesign, but they are there. There is an opportunity. We have signed treaties, we have a lot of things there, but there is also a, uh, another complicated issue, which is a discourse and against the US. This is ideological, this is political. There are some political sectors in Mexico, in Brazil, in Argentina, also in Chile, against the US, against private investment, not against private Chinese investment, but against uh, capitalism from the American point of view. So I think that we need to be mm -hmm. smart this time because it's, there is an opportunity. In the, in the next months and couple of years, there is an opportunity to rethink Latin America and to uh, rethink smart how we, uh, that's why I address this issue about um, you know, informal economy. 
and also about mm -hmm. serv services and human human resources capital and education so in many mm -hmm. countries of latin america you have a very good human resource uh, not only natural resources, but also human resources. And sometimes these entrepreneurs and these human resources are impeded or to progress because of bureaucracy, red tape and bad rules and bad governments. So that's why mm -hmm. there is an opportunity through this uh, technology and uh, you know, to, to, to rethink and to give opportunities for progress to, to the populations down here. Mm -hmm. Hello. Another Sorry, go ahead. A couple of things. One, one is just a, a thought also on, on the, um, the weakening currencies. Uh, and of course, the good news too is this occurs when, for example, in the case of Brazil, most of the debt is denominated not in dollars, but in local currency. Uh, sort of, again, a, a um, testament or an outcome of uh, solid economic policies that allowed that to happen. So where the declining value of the real would have, would have really hurt uh, uh, debtors, including sovereign and, and corporate debt, um, we, it's having less of an effect in this case. So the benefits are, are, are more clear than they would have been, say, 20, 30, 40 years ago. Um, on the case of China, I just want to say a couple of things. Right now, in China will be probably well positioned to be able to, especially given the potential uh, debt crises uh, that's going to happen in these countries. I mean, for example, in, in Brazil, um, 90, basically debt is equal to 93.5% of GDP right now. Um, so, you know, if there are sovereign debt crises uh, and questions about repayment of debt, the Chinese are going to be in a very strong position uh, to be able to buy a lot of that uh, and float a lot of it, which will increase their, their uh, uh, leverage within the region. Great, and Karen, in terms of Mexico, I know obviously the, you know, the AMLO shift on energy reform was um, a, a blow to foreign investors everywhere, but uh, obviously the Chinese were as interested in, as any other foreign investor. What about on the, on the healthcare side? Have there been overtures and offers of um, health-related uh, aid yes, from the Chinese there has, government? Yes, there, uh, there has been equipment flown in from China as well into Mexico, particularly, you know, and this was something we saw in a, in a few countries in the region, and it was particularly heralded earlier, early in the crisis, that um, from the get-go, um, China, uh, it, this was the case I, I know also in El Salvador, that China shipped a very large quantity um, of things like masks and PPE equipment to, um, to Mexico. It was heralded by the foreign uh, minister. Um, but Mexico has a, has a somewhat complicated relationship with China, obviously due to the fact that China um, has been uh, somewhat of a competitor uh, in terms of manufacturing for Mexico. Um, and in addition, you know, Mexico was the country that, that uh, many years ago was the last country to uh, hold up the block to China joining the WTO. So there's sort of a history of tension given what a large portion of Mexico's exports go to the United States. So there, there were these overtures early on, but it, it's a little bit, given the very tight connection between the United States and Mexico, um, it, it, it it's something that is hard to come between that U.S.-Mexican relationship. It's hard to step into that and, and break it apart, given the just how too tied, tightly tied the two countries are, from everything from economy to supply chains to culturally. Um, I do think that if we we were talking earlier about migration and and Venezuela is not a, as much of an issue, um, and Venezuelan refugees are not as much of an issue in in Mexico. Um, although a large number of Venezuelans are becoming are applying for and going through a citizenship process in Mexico now. Um, but uh, we obviously have a, an issue in terms of Central America and Mexico serving as a, as a country uh, between the Northern Triangle countries and, and the United States in terms of migration. That was a huge issue before the pandemic arrived. It's become less of an issue within Mexico, but um, we should keep in mind that the United States to some degree dominates these relationships in Mexico and Central America. Um, there's been a somewhat of a like a carrot and a stick thing happening with Central American countries. Um, it's been interesting to see Guatemala has come forward and accused the United States of deporting people with the coronavirus into the country. 
El Salvador has not. Um, El Salvador has been getting equipment from the United States and Guatemala there has not. So there, the, the proximity to the United States, I think, changes the dynamics a little bit. And Chris, there was very interesting legislation that was supposed to be debated in Congress in Brazil um, in coming months, I think in the near term, one of which was sanitation reform. And um, I can't remember who this quote is attributed to, but somebody said you could have, if sanitation reform had gone through earlier, you could have had 100 million Brazilians washing their hands, which of course would have been just a very basic step in, in helping um, stem the COVID spread. So do you have any sense of where that uh, piece of um, reform legislation stands in the current agenda and its likelihood of making progress? Might it be accelerated by the crisis? I have no idea. Uh, my, my knowledge <laughs> of sanitation conditions in Brazil is fairly limited. Sanitation legislation is, is pretty limited. Uh, so no, unfortunately, I, I can't answer that one. Okay. And how about some of the other reforms generally? Because the big items you know were successful the last couple of years particularly social security reform which was really a 25 year in the waiting um piece of reform do you see anything else on the agenda that might again prove to be a, a positive for brazil in the sense that it would trigger um you know foreign direct and and uh, indirect investors if, if they see progress on it and and so i guess as the health crisis kind of prevails are there still people do you feel that there are politicians that are still saying, you know, kind of keeping people in line saying, look, we've got to pass this stuff. It, it's going to matter uh, to how the rest of the world views us. Yeah, I think, um, first of all, obviously, Bolsonaro has really given carte blanche to, to Geddes uh, on his economic reform plan. And uh, I can s talk about Brazilian bankers here and British bankers in London have a lot of confidence in his ability to push through there was a few pending reforms. Um, so I think that will continue. Um, and, you know, as you mentioned, actually, for Brazilians, th there's a fair amount of concern about how they're being perceived internationally. And so I think that will work to their benefit uh, in terms of passing a series of reforms. And, and you know, and other benefits have been, as they say, the uh, uh, pushing down interest rates, um, fairly despite Bolsonaro's um, let's say, uh, lack of trust in, in or dismissal of, of COVID. They've been very good in uh, stimulus packages uh, and lowering interest rates, as I mentioned, and forgiving debt of states. So uh, they're doing a lot of the right things economically, even if they're not doing it uh, in terms of the uh, uh, sort of, if you will, healthcare policies. Great, thanks. Um, maybe I'll turn it back to Courtney because I know we're getting close to the top of the hour to see if, uh, Courtney, you had any other questions that people brought in or you wanted to ask people to make um, sort of concluding remarks? Yeah, let me check. I mean, I think, I think the, the, the last question that, that I see is, um, is probably for Laura and it's just asking about the perspective on public health in, in Argentina. Um, and uh, and what the situation is, but um, I don't know if you want to comment quickly on that, um, on on what's um, what else is available. But um, that, that that was really the only other question that, that I see coming in. Um, so it seems that some of the um, some of the. Um, hospitals don't have enough uh, supplies. However, the capacity is uh, still low. So we are not reaching, as uh, I said before, uh, th there is no uh, enough cases to worry about. Still, we have low cases. The intensive care units are being used, but they are not, uh, you know, there are a lot of spots that are empty yet. So I think that uh, you know, as, as Chris said before, Argentina also has a widespread uh, public and private health system, which is very different from other cases in, in the region. So uh, I think also that the early lockdown uh, has flattened the curve, but the curve is uh, very, very, very long and it never ends. Mm -hmm. uh, so this has also helped in order not to... Um, you know, to, um, I 
know how to say in English, but to reach the peak of mm -hmm. uh, hospitals capacity. Yeah. Oh, terrific. Well, thank you. Um, um, Jim, thank you so much for, for moderating. Chris, Laura, Karen, um, thank you for just your, your tremendous insights on, on um, the situations in your respective countries and, and Jim for giving such a terrific overview and your understanding of, um, you know, in particular the, the economic side, because obviously I think this is a, this is a story that, that is ongoing for sure, um, you know, in, in everywhere in the world, but I think particularly when we're watching, um, you know, Lord, or you mentioned quite a bit, you know, the, the, the vanishing middle class. Um, and, and I think that some of the tech questions I think are ones that, that we'll continue to see. So, um, you know, with that, thank you. Thanks everyone who, who is listening. Our next briefing is on Monday at noon Eastern time. And that is, um, and it's on China's new diplomacy and what their new foreign strategy is. And that's with, um, Rick Hornick, so it should be a, a good one. So we're, we're shifting shifting continents, and I hope hope you all will join us and, and invite a friend. Um, so thank you, everyone. Really, really appreciate it, um, and have a great great day, evening. Thanks. Bye bye. Thank you very much for having us. Thank you. Thanks, everyone. Bye bye.